it is quarter to nine. It's a balmy 17 degrees. The clouds have cleared. It's a very interesting sight. Free. Some of these people are staying for days. I think it's a bit noisy with train tracks on either side and a freeway running down this side, but other than that, it's pretty nice. Lots of birds. Crazy windy. Yeah, kind of cool. So I'm headed towards Portland. This is the John Day Dam. I've gone over 9,000 kilometers, 90,000 kilometers on this fabulous bike, Faith. Her name is... Wow, there is this shocking number of boats out there. The fishermen, I'm guessing. phone was not charging, which means phone, earbuds, cameras, everything. So yeah, a bit of a problem. But it turns out it's the wiring going to the little USB, not the uh, USB itself. Leaving the Dales, heading towards Portland again. I came off to see a discovery center and I seem to be on some sort of historic highway which is nicer than the freeway This old highway a lot better than the new highway. The 1948 Columbia River flood impacted large portions of the Columbia River watershed, including the Portland area, eastern Washington, northeastern Oregon, Idaho Panhandle, northwestern Montana, and southeastern British Columbia. Above average snowfall in the mountains of the Columbia River watershed during the winter of 1947-48 were followed by heavy rains, causing the Columbia and its tributaries to rise, reaching 8 feet above flood stage in the Portland area by May 25th. Levees generally contained the rivers, but another round of heavy rain and thunderstorms the following week caused multiple flash floods. Dry Creek in Ephrati, Washington, where 60 blocks were damaged, in the Tri-Cities, in the Portland metropolitan area, and in Trail, British Columbia. A 1949 estimate stated property damage reached $102.7 million in 1949 dollars. 250,000 acres of farmland were flooded, 20,000 acres of land were damaged or destroyed, and at least 16 people died. The United States Congress passed the Flood Control Act of 1950, funding the construction of several new dams and levee systems in the Columbia River watershed. The increased interest in flood protection and the growing need for power development initiated 11 years of discussion and alternative proposals for the construction of dams in Canada. Formal ne negotiations began in February 1960 and the Columbia River Treaty was signed 17th of January 1961 by Prime Minister Diefenbaker and President Eisenhower. And sorry Donald Trump, still no mention of water for California. Well, my road has turned to gravel, and there's signs saying dead end. Got some fire burn here, and quite steep. There it is, the dead end. Gotta go back.
This little town is called Cascade Locks. The town of Cascade Locks got its name from the set of locks built to allow navigation around the Cascade Rapids. The U.S. federal government began construction in 1878, and the lock was completed in November of 1896. The locks and the rapids were mostly submerged in 1938 by the Bonneville Lock and Dam. The Bridge of the Gods is a toll bridge that opened in 1926 at a length of 1,127 feet. The bridge is named after a natural dam created by the Bonneville Slide, which occurred around 1450, sending huge amounts of debris south from Table Mountain and Greenlift Peak, covering more than 5.5 square miles. The debris slid into the Columbia Gorge, blocking the Columbia River with a natural dam approximately 200 feet high and three and a half miles long, forming a lake extending 150 miles upriver. Native Americans' oral histories say they crossed the river on the dam, hence the name. The Columbia River eventually broke through the dam and washed away most of the debris, leaving behind the Cascade Rapids. This is the 205 north south. Yeah, so that's the I 5 over there going north to Seattle. These are the Vanport Wetlands on the west side of Portland. Vanport was the city of wartime public housing between the contemporary Portland city boundary and the Columbia River. It was constructed in 1942 to house the workers at the wartime Kaiser shipyards. It was home to 40,000 people, about 40% of them African American, making it Oregon's second largest city at the time. After the war, Vanport lost more than half of its population, dropping to 18,500. Vanport was dramatically destroyed at 4.05 p.m. on May 30, 1948, when a 200-foot section of a railway berm holding back the Columbia River collapsed during the 1948 Columbia River flood, killing 15 people. The city was underwater by nightfall, leaving around 18,000 of its inhabitants homeless. Vanport remained underwater for several weeks following the levee burst and was never rebuilt. Going north. On the north side of the river is the city of Vancouver, Washington. And in the 1790s, a British crew explored the Columbia as far up as Vancouver. This is the Lewis and Clark Bridge, where a bizarre event happened in 1984. On March 27, 1980, the deep sea container ship Hoeg Mascot was headed upstream, passing under the Lewis and Clark Bridge, doing about 8 to 10 knots. The Columbia River pilot on board had taken a larger ship up the same channel just the day before. Just below the Cowlitz River, the ship stopped. She had run aground. The pilot was stunned. How could this be? Several hours earlier, just over 34 miles west-northwest, Mount St. Helens had shaken awake with a series of earthquakes, then a volcanic explosion of 24 megatons, about 1,600 times the size of the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima. That blew out the entire north side of the mountain and sent ash two and a half miles up into the atmosphere. The heat from the eruption melted the mountain's glaciers and snow which combined with some 3 million cubic feet of mud and came ripping down the mountain into the two arms of the Toodle River. By 2.30 p.m., the massive mud flow had destroyed Camp Baker and then took out seven bridges along the river. 
The flow entered the Cowlitz River and continued another 17 miles before the material was injected into the Columbia River, reducing the river's depth by 25 feet for a four-mile stretch. This is what the Hoag mascot had grounded on mid-channel. The mud flow stranded 31 ships upstream. Dredging to remove the debris would take a year. This is Astoria. It is one of the oldest towns on the Pacific Coast. Older than Seattle, older than San Francisco. It grew up on uh, logging and fishing. Seven fifteen, and I'm leaving Astoria. Got to go across this bridge. First of all, what a beautiful morning! So one of the unusual things about the Columbia River is that it's got these highlands on both sides at the at the mouth which keeps it from spreading into a delta causing it to empty out into the into the Pacific Ocean like a fire hose on full where it runs into the westerly swells which slows the current and causes it to drop all of the sediment it's picked up along the way creating the Columbia River bar and that bar is shallow, which causes the ocean swells to pack up. And the current makes it steeper and shorter waves, which creates a very nasty sea at the mouth of the Columbia. It's kind of notorious worldwide. The first documented European discovery of the Columbia River occurred when Bruno de Esseta sighted the river's mouth in 1775, but did not try to enter it. Seventeen years later, in May of 1792, the private American ship Columbia Redeviva, under Captain Robert Gray from Boston, became the first non-indigenous vessel to enter the river. They ventured 11 miles in from the bar to modern-day Gray's Point, north of Astoria. Later, in 1792, William Robert Broughton, commanding HMS Chatham of the British Royal Navy, navigated past the Oregon Coast Range and 100 miles upriver to what is now Vancouver, Washington, sighting and naming Mount Hood after British Admiral First Viscount Hood. Since 1792, approximately 2,000 large ships have sunk in and around the Columbia Bar. ruins from when there was bunkers out here during the Second World War. This is Cape Disappointment. The 
end of the Columbia River. The Columbia River Bar is right in front of us. So, we've seen where it started. We've followed it all the way along to where it ends. But what does it all mean? From the beginning, it has meant food, millions of fish for First Nations and settlers. And it has been transportation by canoe, by steamboat, and then providing routes for railroads to run along and highways. And it's caused great damage with its massive floods, provoking the Columbia River Treaty, which controlled that flood damage and created an opportunity for British Columbia to create massive hydroelectric power, which is really the basis of British Columbia's modern industry. And through the Columbia River Treaty, it, it improved relations between Canada and the United States and continues to provide a big source of revenue for BC. So yeah, it's a pretty amazing river, pretty amazing thing to see and to understand some of its history. 3,505 kilometers total. 2,000 of that was on the river.